So there's poverty and there's poverty. But anyway, um, it kind of really doesn't matter to the poorest of the poor what the GDP is or what the expected growth rate is for next year. Because they, as Australians get richer, you know, the, the result is automatically that they get, they get poorer because they're not ever going to keep up. They're going along like this. <coughs> Australians get richer so that, you know, relatively they're getting poorer. That's, that's just the way it works. But do you see in the sort of resource, the, the, the boom in the resources sector at the moment, the capacity to close that gap? I mean, to bring those, to get those lines moving? It's, it only happens where people are very, very smart and make a smart intervention. So, uh, say for instance at the Argyle Diamond Mine, I visited in April 2000, there were four Aboriginal people working on site with a uh, total workforce of say 800 and two of them were gardeners. Um, this year, the Aboriginal employment rate there is 16% and the Aboriginal employment rate across Rio Tinto is 8%. So 8% of the Rio Tinto workforce is, is Indigenous. And, you know, that's changed since the year 2000 because Rio Tinto, um, CRA became Rio Tinto. Uh, Rio Tinto is dual listed. I, I hear people saying that Rio Tinto is not an Australian company. Actually, it is. It was, it's born and raised in Australia by and large. Yes, there's the international arm of it, but, um, it's, it's dual listed London, Melbourne, and they have their annual AGMs here as well as in London. And most of their executive over the years, until just recently, have come from the old BHP culture. Well, the, sorry, sorry, the Broken Hill culture, mm. right? Which is where BHP gets its name from too. It's the old Broken Hill culture, that's where they came from. And so it's actually a very Australian company in many ways, even though now it's not run by an Australian, and before him it was. And before him it was. So um, so what, 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 what is happening is that slowly from, say, unemployment rates that average about 40% in the Aboriginal community, then they're the official figures, you're getting uh, higher rates of employment. But only because the mining, some mining companies are investing in training. And it's an economic decision. It's not um, a reconciliation program. It's an economic decision based on the costs of labor. And what they've found by investing in Aboriginal labor, which is very expensive, averages more than 45,000 a year, just to train people up. Um, what they found is that because Aboriginal people are the permanent part of the local population, they don't leave. So the investment is worthwhile. The mobile part of the population is the non-Aboriginal population. And so it's a good economic decision to invest in Aboriginal labour. It's more expensive at first, but the investment's worth it in the end because they stay. Hmm. So, you know, just for example, just to give you an example of how things are changing, you know. Hmm. And that's why I'm worried, actually, about the super tax. Because if it's, a, you know, it's, this is why I'm cited in the paper sort of slinging off a line, you know, about how it's a triple tax. Well, it is because they invest in the um, Aboriginal training costs. They pay the wages to Aboriginal people rather than have a fly in, a totally fly in, fly out workforce. And then they'll, you know, if all of these costs are not written off um, as a tax deduction, and there are many other co costs that people don't factor in, uh, well, the government doesn't factor in at the moment, then, you know, they, it could make it very difficult for a company to make that kind of investment in a local area. Because as you can imagine, it's not a popular investment. Because you still have, you know, the non-Aboriginal part of the workforce saying it's not safe to work with them. You know, how do I know I can rely on him on the crew? Is he gonna turn up at work? Don't they all go walk, walk about, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but it, yeah, it's interesting how you get the balance, isn't it? I mean, Dennis, you're shaking your head here. I'd like to bring you into the... I, I'm, I'm not an economist either. And we, I actually think the, the uh, resource tax is perfectly sensible. Um, I think that um, the issues that Marcia is talking about are clearly very important. I think they need to be addressed in all sorts of ways. But 
I'm not in the least bit persuaded by this line that these major companies are going to uh, stop investing in Australia. The dem- if they, they're investing because of the demand. Um, nor do I think it matters, actually, whether legally or not um, these big companies are Australian domicile. The reality is, in the current global economy, um, investments and finance um, moves across borders with, with little restraint. Um, and I actually don't... I mean, maybe symbolically important that CRA have shareholders, uh, have an office in Melbourne, they hold one of their annual general meetings in Melbourne, but in the end, their decisions are not going to be made in ways that I think will be affected by that. Um, so I don't think that's the... I think, to me, the issue is what can the government of a middle-sized economy do to control mega corporations that have a freedom to move their investments in a way that no government, um, it appears, has the ability to contain. In in Lucky Country, Horn wrote, the time might come when broad views of change that now seem impractical will seem sensible and to the point. Um, And I must say that hearing the debate about the resources uh, tax, that seems to me to be something that's touching on a different way of doing business that, that maybe falls into that category. I don't know. Glenn, what's your... Well, it's interesting to think about the way gov- the notion of government has changed. De- um, Dennis touched on it, uh, and if you read Tony Judd's um, book that's just come out, um, "Ill Fares the Country" or something, uh, I mean, he's lamenting that the dis- uh, an earlier discourse about public resources and public invention has been lost, and calling for it to be reinvented, and in doing so, ends up calling for the end to consumerism and a set of, uh, I think, um, uh, ambitious objectives. Mm-hmm. The, the language of how we debate politics then frames what's possible. And if, you, if your language is, in fact, driven by a purely economic um, discourse, then that frames what, what you can think about. And uh, in a sense, one of the things I like about... One of the many things I like about Marsha's article is she's picked up that language and she's applied it in a moral sense. This is, these are the obligations we should take seriously. I, I think we would all be in furious agreement with her about the importance of Indigenous employment in the mining sector and therefore the risk, and then it becomes an empirical question about whether the, the, the tax has proposed. But I, I also think it's worth remembering how hard it has been to get to where we are, how slow that progress was. Mm. And you really are talking about an industry that's 150 years old where those things have only happened in the last 10 years, or 50, since, and in a sense, as you said, since Mabo, 1992. They weren't even necessarily voluntarily taken on. So. Um, it's important that when we have these debates that we don't concede the language Mm. so that we can participate. Otherwise, we're all ruled out. All of us non-economists become irrelevant, which may be a good thing, of course. It it seems to me that that that, that begs the question about the whole sort of resources economy as well. Um, You know, that that there's been a sort of resources economy one way or or another in Australia since the gold rushes. You know, that's always been a part Mm -hmm. of what's happened in in this place. Um, but it's had very much a sort of boom bust mentality, you know, whether it was the gold rushes or the sort of the, the booms in the in the late 1890s, then the subsequent ones in the 60s, and and so on. That they've that they've fallen over because of international markets or because of costs or because of, you know, the resource running out. It seems to me that we're in a, we're moving into a space now which is actually a bit, a bit different to that. Um, that we're actually talking about a scale of industrial mining which is incomprehensible to those of us who haven't. Mm-hmm. Those you haven't seen it, um, you know. These pits are the size of, you know, a size of. I was going to say small countries. That's not right. But, but they are they are of such a scale that they change the weather. You know, that the the trucks are the size of a room. I mean, the the enormity of what's going on um, is quite beyond beyond our sort of care. The, the pits can be seen from outer space. Yeah. Can, can I throw yeah, in sure. another bit yeah. about this? Yeah. Because one of the things that most worries me about the current resource economy is we are increasingly betting our luck on mining and exporting coal, while at the same time we get pious platitudes about climate change. And I think, um, and this goes beyond where you were um, talking about, Master, but it's a whole other dimension where we desperately need some sort of moral equation 
in the public debate. And I think um, that has been sadly lacking on all sides in Australia. And the idea is not just boom and bust, it's also at what point do we actually say we have to stop digging up our resources because of the consequences are far worse than the immediate benefits. The, the country that Donald Horne describes in the lucky country is one that's completely dependent on mining. Mm. And if, if you said to him in 2004, in his last outings, um, you should come to Melbourne sometime, this is a city where education is the single largest industry, the single largest employer, where the revenue that's coming to the state of Victoria comes through its education sector above all else. You may not be a mining state, but here's a state that's created a genuine knowledge economy. If, if knowledge is here measured as income, uh, here's a, a, a city where the two largest employers are a university and Crown Casino. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's <laughs> luck. <Yeah. laughs> um, this is not the image of Australia. This is not how we think about this country. And yet here we have created uh, this extraordinary industry, and frankly, we've created it out of the public mm. sector, which is the other extraordinary part. It isn't privately owned. It hasn't been private investment that's done it. Um, this is a transformation. It, it actually mm. is a country less reliant on mining than would have been true half a century ago when the book was published. That's right. And now, of course, the big issue is, the, say, for instance, you take um, Ravensthorpe, mining mm. town, mm. closed down by BHP Billiton, mm. Um, as the GFC was about to become the perfect storm and uh, the whole everybody was relocated. Well, that's happened over and over again in Australian history. Um, you know, for instance, there's Goldsworthy, that's another, you know, it doesn't, there's no sign that the t a town was once there. And so it's... Um, uh, how, do you, how do you avoid... The big problem now is how do you avoid the dependency of towns like Dampier and Caratha, which are not going to close down, um, but you know there are towns all over Australia that have become utterly dependent on a nearby mining operation. Mm. What happens when the operation closes? I mean, what do those people do? Many of them will not be able to afford to move to a city, especially now, yeah? So how do you create economic diversity in, in many of these places, like take, for instance, Kununurra in the East Kimberley. How do you create economic diversity where there's, which would require enormous amounts of investment? It's really interesting because as you're talking, I'm think, I have this image of Queenstown in Tasmania, mm. uh, which probably many people have been on that extraordinary circular drive down to Queenstown, where you have exactly what you're describing. A couple of thousand people left scrambling to survive, no alternatives, and the one alternative I, su I suspect there is tourism, exploiting, you know, people now come and look at the ravages of a previous mining boom. <laughs> and, you know, if we were pessimistic, I'd say that's what we will see in the towns you're talking about in 50 years' time. But well, no, not in 50 years' time, very soon. Uh, these mines, many of these mines have very short lifespans. Mm. You know, they go yeah. in, they take the ore out, and they're gone. And some, some mines have five-year lifespans, some have 10-year lifespans, some have 20-year lifespans, and, you know, the big bauxite and coal operations They'll have 100 years, possibly even 200. But there are many smaller projects that have very short lifespan, and that's a huge problem. Mm. The, the example that came to my mind as listening to that was, was Wollongong. Mm. Was Wollongong was the creation of the steel and, and coking coal industry, and then when, when that, that sort of reached, well, became less viable. I mean, the, the process of the, that, that shakeout that happened in the huge recession there in the early 80s meant that they had to find a way of redefining Wollongong. And, and what, that, what that threw up was the sort of green, the green town. And it was, very, it was almost impossible for people to imagine Wollongong as a green town because it was a coal and steel town. Um, but and now, a very good university. And, actually, and, and that, was my, that was my point, that, mm. that now is education, which is mm. the key part of that, of that, um, of that economy, um, that and commuting to Sydney. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I mean, it, it does sort of raise that question about how you, how, how you go about leveraging the benefits at the, during the good times so that there is some sort of residual that lasts into the future. And, and that's obviously informed the resources, resources tax proposal. Um, but one of the things that comes to, to strikes me is that you talk about education. I mean, it seems to me that 
the Australia that Horne was describing in 64 was one where you could think about manufacturing behind national borders as something that you would aspire mm. to do. Now, yeah. we all know that that's not the way the world works. So we need to be thinking, it seems to me, differently about what the industries might be that work in a global space, that bounce off the wealth that we're generating out of these, these mines, whether they're short or long term that you know create those other options for people who you know that makes that makes the whole place viable now education is obviously a key to it but you know where do you go from there i mean is there anything more more specific it's interesting how difficult it's proof for governments that have tried to say create um creative industry sectors or we'll we'll set up conditions up so people will come here and they'll design games and they'll they'll do that sort of work and it's very hard to find examples where where it's happened with direction. It happens organically, um, but it doesn't happen where it's supposed to, which mm. tells you that the unpredictability of, of new forms of industry. What worries me about Marshall's question is we actually have lots of experience in this country of setting up communities that are economically unviable. They're called indigenous um, settlements mm. where we've taken mm. people off the land and dumped <laughs> them in one place and said, and now you're a town. Um, and we haven't been very good at solving that problem as... as um, all the work you've done over so long demonstrates it. It is actually worrying that we end up with variations on that model where people can't afford to leave, but there's no reason to stay. It doesn't produce functioning towns. It certainly doesn't produce fulfilled lives. It produces a whole set of other quite significant horrors. Mm. And it's not just Aboriginal people. No. no. You know, I haven't focused what I'm saying on Aboriginal people alone because, you know, there are, say... 50% of Kununurra is, is, is non-Aboriginal. And you'll find that across the sort of remote and regional Australian towns, the proportion of Aboriginal people in the popula population is growing, yes, but you know, there's still 40 to 50% of the small towns are, are, are non-Aboriginal. And um, I mean, I've actually driven backwards and forwards across the country and I pull into one of my favourite places and it's a ghost town. Mm. Yeah. The last time oh. I went through it was okay and mm -hmm. thought, you know, I'll go to the pub. It's not there anymore, it's shut, <laughs> mm. you know? Mm. So, well, it's, it's, it's all, it's, yeah. look, life in remote Australia now is very, very fragile. Housing's a huge issue. There's almost no public housing. Um, and very little investment in remote Australia. Mm because people regard it as an economic basket case except for mining and some adventurous people who are prepared to invest in tourism. Mm. And, you know, I mean, I think we should be worried about it as a national issue. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not just our Aboriginal people. It's everybody out there. Mm. You know, we have a vast coastline. What if it's only inhabited by desperately poor Aboriginal people in 20 years' time? Are we going to feel very comfortable about that? Mm. Mm. Or how about yeah. how about another vision? What if it's occupied by well-to-do Aboriginal people? That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> who, who are concerned about you know biosecurity, for instance, which is the big issue on our borders, isn't yeah. it? But isn't it more that we're likely to have enclaves on the coast that will be occupied by very well-off, retired? Um, people who are, you know, the whole sea change phenomenon side by side with the people you're talking about whose only possible source of income will be service industries for the rich, which, which in a sense perpetuates all these inequalities. Um, that's a question. I'm... I, 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 I can't see Wyndham becoming a sea change town. <laughs> Not Wyndham. <laughs> Not Wyndham. But... In... <laughs> But, but Broome, nearby. But nearby. Broome, well, Broome's a different case, mm. you know, and it was uh, um, Lord Alpine, mm. yeah, mm. who invested mm. in that town and turned it into a tourist town. Mm. He wasn't Australian. Mm. And he was an eccentric English aristocrat. And now nobody can afford to live there. The locals That's can't afford to live there. The point, mm. Mm. yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, actually, parts of the Pilbara, some towns along the Pilbara coastline are becoming those sea change towns. Who would have thought, yeah. you know? But anyway, it's because of property prices. Yeah. Mm. Do, do, I, do, do either of you want to buy, or anyone else want to buy into Dennis's question about the sort of moral dimension of, of mining? In, <laughs> people in the audience do, but do people on the stage? <laughs> right. Happy to go to the audience. Yeah. Marcia, do you want to? 
Well, I think there are moral questions, but governments don't ask moral questions. So what are the moral questions? The moral questions are um, have to do with biodiversity conservation, uh, protecting uh, natural water bodies, and um, you know, conserving and protecting water. Mining operations are big users mm. of water. Um, impacts on local populations. And, uh, <clears throat> and I think, um, you know, that there have to be limits to the amount of vi environmental destruction. I mean, what are we going to do? Are we going to say, we will, won't tolerate more than 10% of our, of our natural environment being destroyed after this point, you know? And how are we going to do this? And what will governments do? Well, they're not very good at it, are they? They're just not very good at uh, these questions. And the, um, they're, not, they're not concerned about the moral questions. And actually, it, there's a lot of sense in the argument that you know, the deep ecologists don't get, uh, that, that, that something w is more likely to be conserved if it has a, a financial value or monetary value or an economic value. So say, for instance, if, say, green turtles are worth X on the international market and it's a well-regulated industry, are local populations going to wipe out local populations of turtles? Most populations are local populations, right? Like the Caribbean population or the, you know, the Indonesian population of turtles. Will they harvest them unsustainably until they wipe them out if there is a monetary value. It's less likely, is my point, where, you know, mm. that is if you can stop poaching, mm. right? I mean, poachers put a black market value mm. on our natural resources, like the poor gorillas and the, you know, the turtles and so on. So how do, you know, how do you respond to that kind of abuse of, 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 of our environments? You know, there's, there's artisanal, what's called euphemistically artisanal mining in many parts of the world, like in Africa and South America. Basically, it's illegal mining, you know? So we're lucky in Australia that we have a lot of regulation, actually, we're very lucky. We don't have the scale of illegal mining, poaching that most of the world has. It seems to me that the, as you talk about that artisan, artisanal mining, it reminds me of, of I spent some time living in that sort of Wollongong area, and during the um, during the depression years, there were lots of little artisan mines, you know, where people set up their little coal mines and they yeah. were digging and it was you know surface coal, but you know that was how they they made their living. And I remember one place that we lived, there was you know a little mine down the bottom of the bottom of the garden, effectively, you know, where, and there was a little makings of how this had been done, you know, so something which is completely at odds with the sort of you know the industrial scale stuff that we we see now, but I, I, it seems to me that the moral question is most likely to come up in in a practical sense in the in the contest over land use, so that you'll see it. Um, and I mean, in New South Wales, it's very it's a very acute discussion at the moment about the mining under the Liverpool Plains, which is a sort of very strong agricultural area. The the process of what's happening in the Hunter Valley um, in New South Wales, and we've got a, a very strong piece in in this collection um, by a woman who's lived there mm. for generations. Mm. You know about the sort of destruction of the environment that's that's occurred to you know to enable that big open cut mining. Well, the destruction in, of food bowls is basically immoral, isn't it? Well, that's, it seems to me that's where the, yes. the flashpoint comes. Um, the Surat Basin in Queensland, again, I mean, it's an area of intensely rich agricultural land, which is now the, you know, where the, where the, where the, the gas is being taken out for the liquefied natural gas. Now, taking your argument, there's an economic value which is greater for the mining, you know, for the mining products. There's a legislative framework which favours mining over, over agriculture. Um, I'm, I'm just sort of interested in how you think this, this sort of tussle might, might play out. Because my, my concern was the, cons the, the, the global consequences of reliance upon, mm. and, and the example I gave was coal, and of course in this state we um, do very badly in terms of our contribution to emissions because of the way we generate power using um, environmentally destructive coal. Now, I actually recognise Marcia's point. I mean, I don't think there's. I don't think we are going to persuade governments 
uh, to stop the coal industry because it would be morally better for the world. We might, however, start arguing that in the long run, this is unsustainable at a global level. And Australia has not just a responsibility, which is a word at which governments start rolling their eyes, um, but actually has a self-interest in thinking through what alternatives there are. And I don't think that in the long run, being someone who on the whole believes that most scientists are probably right about climate change, I don't think in the long run uh, the whole-scale mining of coal that seems to be driving at least two or three of our state governments is sustainable morally, economically, um, or even practically. But, you know, I'm sure... I mean, I don't know. I, I throw some of this out as a question, and I know there are people who know much more about this than I do. Um, my sense is that's where the big moral issue lies. I'm just slightly nervous about the way we're now using moral. Yes. I mean, a clash between, mo between agriculture and mining is not actually a moral no. question, um, unless you say landscape has some moral value. That, and I, I, I raise this because there's a famous case from New South Wales that I used to teach in public policy about how you can manipulate moral categories. And it was of a, mine, a mining company that owned a limestone quarry which had become an uneconomic, principally because it was now surrounded by national park and the cost of getting the trucks in and out through the national park and the limits on that had made the, the limestone quarry just not worth. And the company was about to just close it down but decided to hire a consultant to give them some advice. The consultant came in and said, I, I see an opportunity here. Um, Claim to have found a rare species of bat in one of the caves of the limestone quarry helped organise the local protest group who um, saved the bat. Um, and the New South Wales government, uh, under moral pressure, bought the limestone quarry and gave it to the National Park. And the mining company <laughs> couldn't believe its success. Um, people use moral categories. What they mean is my interests are... And we have to be yes. careful. These are political questions, and political questions aren't always moral questions, but political questions have to be, in this case, taken seriously, I mean, for all the reasons we've identified. Right. Yeah. The moral question with the mining of food bowls is this, and it's, you know, it's very long-term and it's very indirect, but the moral question is, if Australia destroys its best food bowls, mm. right, yeah. with mining, or, or however they do it, it's not mining in particular, mm. um, it could be, you know, an idiot water policy that destroys them, for instance. It, it, you know, it doesn't have to be mining. But Australia will have to import that food and then Australians will have to buy into the degraded food chain of the rest of the world. And, um, you know, our citizens eat second-rate food instead of our own first-rate food. That's, that's a moral question, isn't it? That we doom future generations to eating food from a degraded food chain. I mean, how many yeah. people, housewives now, including myself, and I'm not a housewife, but, you know, I always check, is this garlic from China or Australia, you know? Yeah. You just you can, do. You can you do, tell by the price You don't tech. want to buy yeah. polluted food. Yeah. You don't want to feed your family polluted food. And economists would say that's our failure to put a, an appropriate price on what we value and to actually force ourselves to pay. And it's like the argument about a carbon tax. If you don't put a price on sending up carbon, then you go on doing it. And I worry with some of these questions that it's actually our failure to say, this is worth this to us, that, and we're going to... Risk that's what I mean pay. about putting a price on it. I'm yeah. not just talking yeah. about the present price. I'm talking yes. about the long-term price. Fa yeah. You know, do all of your... Crunch all mm. your numbers and yeah. put the real price on it. Yeah. You, you just, know, like water has has a ridiculously low price, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we're hopeless at doing that present value, and we're absolutely yeah. hopeless at we discount the future all the time for the present because it's much more easy and familiar to do. And, and because in the end we might just be lucky. So on <laughs> on that note, I would like to thank our speakers this evening very much for coming along and talking about their their thinking and their writing. Um, I would urge you all to read their pieces. I mean, they really are all very outstanding essays, and I would encourage you to read them. And if you're feeling in the mood to take out a subscription to Griffith Review as well, thank you.